So uh, Uber Research, what we do is data about scientific research funding. We have a product called Dimensions uh, that was initially targeted at uh, funding institutions. So people like the National Institutes of Health, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, uh, institutions that grant money for scientific research to various uh, universities, um, cooperative projects, and things like that. And they need a way to, well, first of all, they want to be able to access data about where all of money, how the money is moving around in the scientific research world. They know about their own money, but they want to be able to compare it to other funders and see how uh, portfolios are comparing and things like that. And also be able to do some analysis, uh, do some reporting tools. So we have um, a series of products designed with, with funders in mind, but we are also now opening up to um, making useful tools for researchers and research organizations, universities, uh, things like that. So that is our domain, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit later about uh, the query language we've built to be able to interact with that data in uh, a programmatic way instead of in the visual way that we had been um, exclusively using to, to get at that data before. Velo, meanwhile, as I said, you've probably heard from them. And of course, I do not work for them. So please uh, take what I say with a grain of salt. I am just a friend of Velo and appreciator. And uh, you should definitely take the word from the horse's mouth. There's so many Veloians here. You can, uh, you can ask them for more exact details. But their, uh, their shtick is data streams, um, streaming data that comes in in real time. And uh, you want to be able to Anal uh, do analysis and, and get all the information that you need from that data as it comes in right now in real time, as I said, and also historically uh, looking back at the streams that you've seen in the past. And so they have kind of a, a, a whole comprehensive uh, product that, that spans the whole flow of this data, the storage, the interaction. And what I'm going to be talking about is the query language that they've developed as a way to interact with that data. You like this mic is popping a little bit. Is that still okay for people in the back? Great. Okay. Um, they're also really good at organizing conferences on the beach, so big thanks to them for that. <laughs> okay, back to query languages. Uh, I've been using this phrase custom query language a lot. What am I even talking about? Um, perhaps this is something that doesn't need to be covered, but I think it's important that we break this down and just really make sure that we're all on the same page about what it is that we are and are not talking about here. Um, so going word by word, when I say custom query language, I mean custom, domain specific. We're not trying to reinvent, uh, come up with the next great all-purpose, um, generally applicable query language, the next SQL or NoSQL or GraphQL or something like that. No, we're talking about a way of querying a very specific type of data, whether that be a particular data set, as in the case of Uber Research, we have our data about scientific research funding. We have the largest, as far as I know, the only comprehensive database of that type of data. Or whether it be a specific type of data, as with uh, Velo, they're focused on, uh, on time-based streams of data. Although their initial uh, application, their, their kind of uh, the, the clients that they were first focused on working with is in the finance domain. So that also comes to bear a bit. And of course, we can imagine lots of other particular domains, uh, whatever you all are working on, each application has its own specific needs. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a query language that is built only for that one particular scenario. And by query, I mean a language that's intended to retrieve and analyze data. Not necessarily a language that's, uh, in general, like a domain-specific language that you could use to, let's say, let your domain experts, maybe they're um, on the business team at your clients, um, configure their application or, or um, uh, submit data to your stores. We're just talking about pulling information out. So I'm not going to be talking about how we, how we interact with, uh, let's say, uh, sending new data to the database or changing things around, configuring an application, just retrieval and analysis of that beautiful data that you already have. And probably nobody was actually asking themselves, what does she mean by a language? But let's get philosophical, because I used to be a philosophy major. I like doing that kind of thing. What are we even talking about as a language here? I think that the, the most helpful way to understand a language in this sense, in the application that uh, we're going to be talking about today, is as an interface to your data. 
that's really all it is. Just like a, a graphical web interface is an interface to your data. It is not the data itself. It is just a window to it. And here we're just talking about an interface that's textual instead of visual. So that's going to be kind of a driving theme. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to take a look at how we can uh, develop that interface in the best way for your particular domain. And I think that that's, um, all of this kind of gets wrapped up in a, in a nice quote uh, from Martin Fowler in a great book he wrote on domain-specific languages, conveniently titled Domain-Specific Languages, uh, in which he says that uh, the great thing about a DSL, a domain-specific language, and this also applies to a custom query language, which is just a special case thereof, is that it is a common text that is both executable software and a description that domain experts can read. So your client, your domain expert, they know what it is that they want. They can write that down and then literally press play and get that exact thing out. So this is what's really great about domain-specific languages in general. And one of the, the main advantages of having a, a custom query language is that you don't need, you don't have the client coming to you and saying, I want X, Y, Z, and you have to go and type your little query. It's all right there in front of you. It is one and the same. So this is what we're, we're focused on. And then the question is why, uh, well, uh, what, uh, what could we do with these languages that we couldn't do with, let's say, a general purpose query language? So to take a look at uh, our two particular use cases, I'm going to be using some examples from uh, the Dimensions query language and the Velo's query language. Dimensions query language looks like this. It's, um, it's pretty SQL inspired. It's intended to allow the user to specify what type of, uh, of, of scientific work they want to search. So for example, grants, like funding grant applications, or patents, or uh, journal publications, things like that. Uh, they can search for, for certain topics. We can even do full text kind of uh, matching, the sort of uh, document retrieval by that, uh, by, by text natural language. Uh, we can also uh, restrict the set of documents by um, metadata related to entities that are involved somehow in how that, uh, that scientific work got produced. So in this case, the funder. We can also look up attributes of researchers or universities or other entities involved. And then they can also specify not just what uh, set of documents they want to query, but what information they want back from those documents. And there we can we can break it down. We can do some aggregation operations. They can tell us what exact uh, metadata they want about the various entities involved, how they want it to be sorted, et cetera. Now, this is just uh, the syntax that we uh, have now. It's gone through several iterations in just the short time that we've been working on it. And it will go through several more, as I'll mention a bit later. But this is how things look at the moment, quite SQL inspired, as I said. Velo's query language is also inspired by that same uh, model. And uh, as I said, the, the focus here is on streams. So they make it very easy to specify which stream you'd like to look at, um, how you want those samples to be grouped together, um, the windows that you'd like to look at, how large they are, how they overlap, that sort of thing. And then what information, what analysis you want done on each of those windows. And you know, we can do things like simple averages, but they also have a lot of very clever um, analytical functions built in. You can define your own, that sort of thing. For more details, please consult our friends at the Velo booth. <laughs> so with these languages, um, well, at least uh, speaking for myself, from um, research, uh, I often get the question a lot, OK, why have you done this? Why have you created your own query language? We have so many great query languages already, too many to count, really, too many to really wrap your head around, some of them very, very different from one another. So even if you're not satisfied with just you know, good old SQL, uh, there's a bajillion other solutions. Why not just pick one of them? Why would you want your own? And the answer to that question is really, for the abstraction, for the very specific abstraction of your particular use case. So that's my whole talk. Uh, Y'all can go enjoy the beach now. We're done. Ciao. No, just kidding. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that, but this is really the whole idea. It's to get an abstraction that you can write down and then run. So. The big uh, concept here is modeling uh, and the idea of having a 
a, a mental model of your data is kind of non-negotiable. Your user will have a mental model of your data whether you have one written down on paper or not. And your applications, your interfaces, your visualizations, your analysis, all of that will operate on some kind of model. The question is how, uh, how well it fits what your users are trying to be able to do, how well it fits the domain experts' understanding of the data and how easy it is to uh, make your software play nicely with that model. And so when you're using a general purpose query language, um, you might find that, yeah, sure, it's possible to express the logic uh, and the, the kind of declare what it is that you want in the concepts available to you from that general language. But you might have to be doing a little bit of finessing, a little bit of hacking, a little bit of shoehorning your concepts into the concepts that they gave you. And it doesn't always work out very elegantly. If you want the most elegant expression possible, write down exactly what your data looks like conceptually. So for example, for Velo, uh, time is of the essence. They're dealing with streams of data. These are samples coming in over time. And time is not something that a lot of query languages out there are able to model well. And so this is one motivation that they had for uh, coming up with their own, was to be able to define the semantics that they needed and not have to try and force that idea into something uh, which wasn't really meant for it. And so here, their language is really kind of focused uh, or, or makes it very easy to express how you want to deal with the time uh, related aspects of your data. So for example, we have this keyword historical, which you can just add in a keyword that says, I want historical data. And if it's not there, we assume you're dealing with real-time data. Um, you can, there's, there's uh, semantics for, for describing the windows that you want, how they overlap, what type of windowing strategy you're using. And everything in the language kind of uh, is, it, this idea of time is a first class citizen, as it were. It's a first class concept. And that's the advantage of, of defining your own language. You get to define which concepts are most salient. And another advantage that comes into that is, is that uh, by having that model uh, encompassed in a query language, you get to decouple the other parts of your application or applications from each other. So um, that could mean, on one hand, decoupling the, the way you display that data or sort of other user interfaces that you layer on top of that, decoupling that from the model, and also decoupling how you store that data, how it's implemented, what it actually looks like on the back end, all of the usually ugly duct tape and paper clips holding things together. Being able to separate that out and have a nice clean model that it all revolves around can be a real advantage. Um, and this was something that particularly motivated us uh, at Uber Research with the dimension situation. We had this, um, we had been building everything very much centralized around this, uh, this web interface. It was kind of our only way of getting at the data. And so we were thinking our, our, our logic was very much tied into the ideas of how we display this on a website, how we walk users through it, how they interact with it. In this particular type of interface. So our model and our display, our, our visual interface there, were very, very tightly coupled. And this became a problem as we realized, wait a minute, we don't want to only be able to only tie ourselves to this web interface. We also want to be able to expose our data to other consumers that might have different needs. We are a portfolio company of uh, a company called Digital Science that has a lot of other um, sort of our sister companies that deal with various other uh, aspects of the science um, uh, science and research space. They have other products to deal with uh, that, that, uh, that universities and funders would need for, for different needs. And they all need to be able to talk to each other. That means we need other types of, we need APIs, we need um, services that can expose this data in other ways. So the fact that we have this model of our data that's very closely linked to how we've been displaying it in our website is uh, going to hold us back. And then we also had the problem that, uh, so our, uh, our back end, our, our storage is in solar because as I said, we do a lot of um, text uh, sort of text-based retrieval and things like that. And so we also had very tight links between the, uh, the interface, the, the visual interface, and the way it was implemented in solar, the way our data is being stored. That's also not what you want, because we were thinking, well, maybe eventually we want to move away from solar. Maybe we want to have other options for our back end. And so we found that if we pull out that model, and if we use this query language as a way of defining and 
making precise this this model. Then we have um, you know the interface, the web app itself has to do much less work. It just has to display the data. It just has to talk to the model and, and make it pretty. Um, of course, it's more complicated than that. There's a lot of user interface uh, issues there, but but it doesn't have to worry also about conceiving of the data in the first place. And then for our back end, um, we, we get that untangled from the, the visual part, the front end. And so if we want to later uh, switch out our back end uh, to something like Elastic, another sponsor here, or if we want to add on other, uh, other interfaces, uh, web APIs, what have you, if some other need, some other consumer comes up that we can't even conceive of yet, we already have a nice clean model of what our data should look like that we can use as a foundation for what have you, whatever may come up. So these were, uh, these were our motivations for sitting down and writing out this query language. The question is, do we even need to implement it? So Martin Fowler in that same book, Domain Specific Languages, he says that trying to describe a domain using a DSL is useful even if the DSL is never implemented. It can be beneficial just as a platform for communication. So he said the advantage of having a DSL uh, implemented is that you have a piece of source code that your users, your domain experts, can write down what they want and then they can actually execute it. But even if you don't execute it, the simple act of writing down what you want and how you want to be able to talk about and interact with your data is already really valuable. So even if I stop working on implementing the dimensions uh, query language, if I just like stay here in Malaga on the beach and never go back to Berlin, which I'm really tempted to do, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that we haven't gotten something out of this project. We've already, just by virtue of sitting down and trying to write down this language, we've already done a lot of work kind of cleaning up the, the debt around our uh, abstractions. And those abstractions can then be useful even if we don't actually change anything, um, if we don't actually implement a, a query language that we execute as such. The, th the simple act of sitting down and forcing ourselves to write that out has already cleared our heads, as it were. So uh, these are some of the motivations why you w might want to write a query language. If you have decided that this is the way to go and this is what you'd like to do, how do you do that? How do you sit down and write out what you would like to be able to say, what you would like to be able to declare in your language? Well, as I said before, I think that a language is first and foremost an interface, especially a query language is ex explicitly an interface to your data. And I think that the same principles that, uh, let's say, web user interface designers use to design a good graphical visual UI also come to bear when you're designing a textual UI. So these are some qualities that, uh, according to Smashing Magazine, and I'll take their word for it because they make really pretty things, uh, that they say are important to consider when you're building a user interface. So um, just to really quickly go through these, the uh, first one is clarity, expressing what you want clearly, no ambiguity, concision, doing it as quickly as possible or as shortly as possible, familiarity, leveraging uh, existing knowledge, Responsiveness, which we usually think of in terms of snappiness, but also has to do with how the language responds to the user, how the interface gives feedback. Uh, consistency, you want to not mix metaphors. Uh, aesthetics, now usually we think about that in terms of visual appeal, but we, language also has an appeal. The, the, the way a query flows can be better or worse. It can be nicer or less nice to write. Efficiency, of course, in terms of the implementation, but also in terms of how quickly can the user get to where they want to be. And then forgiveness, what happens when the user says something that isn't exactly what they wanted? How, how does the language help them correct that? So I think that these, uh, these qualities in general are helpful to think about, but for myself and for the team at Velo, as they've been designing, there are a couple of key sort of uh, guiding lights, guiding beacons that we've found have been helpful to pull all of this together. The first one is that, uh, first and foremost, the whole point is that the user can easily express what they want in this language. It sounds trivial to even say that because that's the whole thing that we're talking about, but that is the whole thing that we're talking about. The user has to be able to easily say what they want to get out of your system. And uh, this means that 
you know, all of those times where your client comes to you and says, I want to be able to do X, Y, Z, you know, go get it for me. The language should be able to let them express that in a way that they instantly get what they want. Everybody's happier. They're happier because they don't have to wait on you. You're happier because you don't have to talk to them and everything goes better. So this pulls in a few of those qualities that, that we just uh, looked at especially concision, you want to be able to give them in the language, give them the concepts and the, the words, the phrases that they need to be able to express exactly what they want and no more. And that, of course, ties back into familiarity, leveraging the domain experts, your clients, existing knowledge of it may be the words that they already use to talk about the domain. Uh, it may also be using uh, metaphors or st structures from tools that they are used to using, whether that be other query languages or other, other types of tools. And then, of course, um, aesthetics and efficiency. Uh, this should be something that the, the, the aesthetics of your language is sort of defined by this, defined by how expressive, uh, how easily it is to express the idea that the client has of what they want. So I think a good example of this is that historical keyword from Velo that I just mentioned. The need to switch back and forth between real-time data as it comes in and taking a look back at all of the data that, that has already been persisted to storage that you want to analyze uh, going back in the past, so looking to the future or looking to the past, that is kind of a fundamental need to Velo's customers. And so in their language, they have a single word that whose presence or absence uh, makes that switch. It couldn't really be much simpler. And this is, I think, representative of this type of, uh, this type of guiding principle here is if there is a way you can make it a single toggle or a single phrase or a, a single expression for this type of, uh, of choice or need, do it that way. Don't have a whole other complicated apparatus, which is unfortunately what you might need to do if you're using a general purpose query language that wasn't built to make this exact choice. That's the, that's the whole uh, beauty of it. So another guiding principle is that the user shouldn't need to go to the documentation. The language should tell the user everything they need to know, or at least as much as possible. So if the user is going to the docs a lot, if the user is asking you a lot, hey, how do I use XYZ feature? That's indicative that there's probably some kind of redesign needed. And this ties into uh, a, few different, uh, a few different principles. But the way I like to think about this all is that what you want to do in the language is provide the user signposts to go from where they are to where they want to be, guiding them each step of the way, kind of holding their hand through it. Instead of giving them a giant map, your documentation, or all of these great features that they could possibly use, and then making them find their own path, making them map out their own course. So uh, clarity, of course, comes into play there. You want the, the words and the features, the phrasing of your language to be kind of self-explanatory, uh, which means, of course, if you're using familiar concepts, that's more likely to happen. You're kind of uh, not forcing your users to wrap their heads around too many new things. And, um, and being consistent with the, uh, with the concepts that you do use. And you also want the user's experience with the language to be kind of a dialogue. And this is where responsiveness and forgiveness come in. You want the user to be able to interact with your language basically in the same way that they would interact with you if you, they were asking you to write the queries for them. So this is something that we've tried to keep in mind in the dimensions language uh, in the form of expressive and suggestive error messages. Um, if you, let's say, enter a, a document source, ooh, that's, that's some rough contrast there, but this says unknown source articles. Um, if you entered a, you know, you wanted to search articles, but the language doesn't have any concept of articles, it won't just say, nope, can't do it, sorry, as most, uh, most of the time we're used to experiencing, it will say, I can't do that, but I do know all of these things. Did you mean one of those? And we can, of course, imagine then even more helpful tooling around that, whether if, you know, if this is embedded in some kind of interface, we can have things like auto-completion, all the nice stuff that we're used to in our IDEs and things like that, we can give that to the users so that as they're executing and typing their queries, the, the language itself can help them get to the place that they're trying to go. However, no matter how good we are at making concise and familiar and responsive designs, we're not going to get it right the first time. This is like the only truth. It will change no matter how good it was to begin with. 
And this is something that as software developers, we have to embrace and accept in everything that we build, but it's no less true of the language. So as usual, we have to design for things to change, for, for us to be wrong and it be okay in the future. Um, and this is, of course, helped if we get the language in front of actual users as soon as possible to get their feedback, to see what they struggle with, what they enjoy, what they, what they need that we didn't even think of yet, just as with any interface or really any, any product. Um, and uh, Velo, for example, found that uh, once they had gotten you know, a relatively stable prototype going, opening that up to a community, uh, open sourcing the, the language so that uh, more eyes could get on it and we could get feedback from a whole community, that that was something that helped them with the designing process. And at Uber Research, we've, we've also seen that with, as I said, talking to some of our sister companies and see what their needs might be for this type of data as a nice way to, to get that sort of internal feedback before we, um, before we make any uh, decisions that are gonna be hard to reverse later. But of course, we are gonna reverse decisions later. So as usual, we wanna build software just like we always do that is as easy to change as possible. Um, and so this could mean you, you wanna be able to change uh, features of the syntax, you wanna be able to change uh, how the implementation of the language uh, is done. Of course, you have to keep in mind that there is a trade-off between this aspect of familiarity and the aspect of change. Because once you've put a concept out there and you've asked your users to wrap their heads around it, they're not going to want to wrap their heads around something else. So it's really a, a whole set of trade-offs here. But um, in general, the idea that the syntax and the structure and the concepts of your language will change going forward is something unavoidable. So OK, uh, we've been talking about the design of the language, its features, it, its uh, use as an interface. but how could you actually build something like this? Uh, well, just like any language, you need to go from some text, some characters, to a syntactic representation, usually a tree, of the query that your user is, is, uh, is putting into the system. And that means you need, as with any language, um, a recognizer that uh, lexes or tokenizes your string into meaningful chunks, which uh, are not visible on this PDF, but, um, and then parses those chunks, those tokens, into a tree, uh, a syntax tree, uh, AST. And this part is crucial. You need it. The question is, where do you get it? You could have a parser generator tool build it for you, which is great because it means you don't have to do that work. It's automatic. Uh, so you can get to that first prototype very quickly. And that's great for putting it in front of users as quickly as possible, which, as we said, is important for the design process. And um, there are tools out there like Antler, which is a kind of uh, multi sort of polyglot uh, parser generator. And Parboiled2, which is for Scala, which the Velo team has been using. And these are great, but they do have the downside that you lose some control over the details of how this is done. Most of these do, do allow you to configure things to a certain extent, but uh, the internal representation of that tree, for example, is going to be largely out of your hands. So if you need to retain that control, then you're looking at creating your own tokenizer, your own parser. Um, these, are, these are problems that are, you know, there's plenty of resources out there to help you do this, but you might find that putting, focusing on actually processing the text is not really what is crucial there. Because as I said, the whole idea here is abstractions. So we have found that the more time you can spend thinking about the big picture concepts, and the less time you have to worry about how those little tokens are coming into your, uh, into your parser, the better. So that's why um, both Velo and Uber Research have gone with the parser generator strategy. So um, just uh, in the last uh, few minutes here, wanted to talk about Antler, which is what uh, we have been using at uh, Uber Research for the Dimensions query language. So ANTLR, Antler, stands for Another Tool for Language Recognition. Uh, it's uh, currently in version 4, which is quite different from previous versions. So in case you're looking for the, the latest and greatest, that will be 4. And um, it's basically a Java tool that gives you a uh, lexer and parser, generates the code to, to do that processing for you from a grammar, uh, which defines the structure of your language, which we'll look at an example of in a moment. 
And that code that it generates, it doesn't have to just be in Java. It also has targets uh, for lots of other languages, Python, JavaScript, various other choices there. Um, it, is, it is not an infinite set of choices, but it should work for most, uh, most use cases. And uh, I believe they're always adding more. And so this is, this is really a good solution for a lot of folks. A lot of people like it uh, because it's uh, also well documented. There's a comprehensive uh, book uh, that Terence Parr, the, the author of it, pictured here, um, wrote documenting all of, its, uh, all of its great features. But really, the flow of it, of using a tool like this, is quite simple. Um, you write a grammar that defines the, the syntax that you're trying to, uh, that you want your language to follow. And from that grammar, Antler, or a similar parser generator, gives you a lexer and a parser for free. You just get them. They're, they're there. They're yours. If you feed the lexer and parser with a query, you get out for free a, an abstract syntax tree, an AST, representation of the structure of that query. And you also get uh, for free some tools for traversing the tree uh, for example, a listener or visitor, slightly different patterns for, for walking through the tree and handling uh, the inputs that you see at each various node. And you can then extend that listener with your own functionality so that as you walk through the tree, you accomplish whatever it is you'd like to do with your language, whether that be, let's say, uh, compiling it to a query in whatever language of the, the the database you're using, um, or doing something more dynamic, more interpretive, uh, actually acting on things as you see them come in. It's totally up to you at that point. So uh, the grammar that you might write, uh, it's pretty simple. It can get uh, a lot more complex, but the idea is that you just write a bunch of rules that define how various parts of your queries are composed, uh, what options, what alternatives uh, each of them has. So here we have a grammar that's just uh, called query. It's, uh, it has a, a, a top root level phrase called query that breaks down into a target, a results, and an end of file token. That just means that's it. That's all there is, uh, a target and results. And then each of those breaks down into, you can include individual tokens here. For example, a target phrase, I'm expecting a search token, verbatim, not a capital S, none of that. Uh, and then maybe I have a filter at the end. So we have various uh, operators that are pretty, will be pretty similar to you. It's pretty easy to get the hang of. There's a lot of complexities that you can uh, get into here. You can express pretty much any language that you'd need. It even deals with things like recursion very elegantly. So I uh, won't go into all the details of that. But suffice it to say, this is, this is uh, one of the hard parts, is once you've got that concept, writing it down as the grammar. Not, not, too, uh, not too difficult, just takes a little wrapping your head around. And then from that grammar, you jump through the lexer and parser steps and the syntax tree steps. You get this tree out, and then uh, Antler 4 will give you a listener for that grammar. So in this case, it's called query listener, that gives you um, a bunch of enter and exit methods that as you walk the tree, allow you to uh, do whatever you need to do with each of the nodes that you get. So as you go through the tree, you have information about which rule you're entering. In this case, it's the target rule that, that created this node that would be kind of a top level node here. Uh, and it gives you context information about uh, the, the tokens that you're seeing in that particular node, uh, the parent nodes, the children, uh, things like that. So really, you have all the information you need from this very simple structure to build whatever kind of translator, compiler, or uh, interpreter, whatever kind of, of actions you need to do as you see parts of that query come in. Uh, Antler makes that quite simple for you. So your task, you can forget about the, the lexing and parsing completely and just think about what you want the language to look like, the grammar, and what you want the language to do, the, the uh, compiler or interpreter. So if you uh, don't need too much fine-grained control, this can be a good way to go. And that's the way that both of our companies have chosen. So in my last couple of minutes here, and then we can take some questions, and then maybe even have some time for some sunshine between these talks. I thought we were going to be on the beach, right? <laughs> um, let's, just, uh, let's just recap the points that I've uh, hopefully made today. So why would you even bother building a query language? Well, because it's a really nice way to have a, 
a model of your domain and your logic that you can actually run, you can actually execute, as Martin Fowler uh, pointed out. And that can be very helpful for not only uh, having, like forcing yourself to sit down and think about that model, but also for uh, untangling that model from other parts of your application, like the display and the storage. If you've decided to go ahead and tackle a custom query language, uh, treat it as an interface. Don't forget that it is just an interface to data, and it follows the same kind of rules as visual interfaces do. Um, and of course, as with all development, build for change. Don't expect that you're going to sit down and write down your language and have that be perfect and the way that it will always be. Your version 0 0.1 is not going to look, well, might not look at all like your version uh, 5, who knows. And uh, if you're going to implement this language and not just sit down and write it out, which is already valuable, as we saw, if you're actually going to make it something usable, um, consider parser generators, because there are some really good ones out there, very powerful, lots of, of possibilities for customization, and they can get you to that first prototype faster so that uh, you can put it in front of users faster, do those iterations that you need to do to, uh, to get to that final, stable, useful, beautiful version. Um, and all you have to give up is a little bit of control over the inner workings of the, the parsing. So this is basically my talk. Um, I want to give, again, a big thank you to Velo and Tobias Johansson in particular for, uh, for letting me share also some of their insights in this talk. And uh, yeah, again, I'm Anjana Vakil. You can find me on Twitter or my email right there. Uh, happy to, to answer some questions now. I think we have some time yes. and also happy to, to chat later. Well, thank you very much. Well, do you have? So who has questions? Good. Um, I'd like to ask you, how do you keep the data updated? Uh, when do you fetch the, for the data? When do you fetch the data? Well, that, I mean, this is the nice part, is that that has really nothing to do with the language itself. Um, how you're implementing the data and how you're, uh, how you're choosing to implement the language is different from the model that the language gives you, right? So that is nice because it allows you to make different choices. If you're deciding that your strategy for uh, how, you're, how you're taking in data, your, your pipeline of ingestion and things like that, if you need to make changes to that, uh, your users don't have to know anything about that. And even the developers uh, working on your, on your interfaces, on your web app, let's say, also don't need to worry about that because they only have to talk to the query language. So for at least for our language, it doesn't really, it doesn't as a language care where the data is coming from or how it got there or when it got there. It is just uh, looking at the state of things in the moment when, well, in, in our implementation, when that uh, query is being executed. Uh, you could also choose to do lots of different things. You could choose to to have the, the user enter their queries. You compile them to your queries in whatever it may be, SQL, what have you. And, uh, and you stockpile those, and then you execute them all later once you've finished XYZ operation, and then you send the results back. All of that is completely uh, flexible and, and then sort of hidden underneath the abstraction layer that the language provides. Hope okay. that non-answer answers your question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Anyone? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <sighs> and then you. Well, uh, I know maybe it's a stupid question, but here. Hi. <laughs> uh, uh, the tools that you provide uh, for the syntax, they give you a kind of validation also for ambiguity that you can have in your query language? So ideally, you would want to not have ambiguity in your language. If you have ambiguity that the parser, so for example, um, with Antler, it uh, won't actually let you compile a grammar that has ambiguous rule operations. It will make decisions, like for example, if you incorrectly in your grammar define <laughs> define um, two rules that, uh, that, that uh, could apply to the same input, it will just take the first one, and so it'll resolve ambiguity in that way. If, however, you define something in such a way that the grammar itself is ambiguous, it will say, no, 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 hold on, I can't build a parser out of this, tell me exactly what you want. And then if in the way you've built your grammar there is some type of ambiguity that 
isn't addressed syntactically. Like for example, for us, we have to distinguish different uh, different types of names that you, you can't really distinguish based on the, the structure of the token, the, the characters that it's composed of, then that's something that you have to build into your, uh, your implementation. And you know, while, you're, while you're traversing the tree, you'd have to make certain decisions and, and put in checks there or else those kind of ambiguities are gonna fall through. But that's kind of the same as, as with any with any program, really. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We have another question there. And then here. Uh, here's first. If you have many different types of experts in your organization, won't a lot of time uh, be spent on like standardizing the communication and stuff like that? Should you even bother in that case if they can't even? Should you bother uh, de designing a language, yeah. or should you uh, should you bother trying to design one language for all of them? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Well, um, I think the answer is you you need to address their needs somehow. If it doesn't seem that there is one expression that would work for all of them, then perhaps that means you need to take a step back and sort of say, all right, well, are we really designing the same product with two different use cases, or is this really two different things that we're talking about? But I, I think um, the most kind of practical answer to that question, um, there's a great talk by Lee Byron, who is the developer of GraphQL at Facebook, and he gave a talk, I think at Strange Loop last year, about how they designed GraphQL. And he has a really great point in there that it's good to start with uh, one client in mind, one user that you're putting it in front of and that you're getting that feedback from. Uh, because everyone is going to want something slightly different. And once you've got one user, perhaps you, know, you have to triage and prioritize who that, who that should be. Uh, but once you've st got a starting point from working with them and communicating with them and you've put something down on paper or code in our case uh, that, that expresses what they want, then it's easier to get other people on board with that. Uh, when you put it in front of them and say, we have this, rather than trying to ask 100 people, what do you want? You can have anything in the world. Obviously, you're going to get a 1,000 different answers. So focusing on just one person's answer, uh, and by person, of course, I mean whatever group, uh, that can be a good place to start and give you at least a foothold. I think we have more. OK, so uh, let's say that you already have the data, but you don't have the language yet to query for it. So it's quite tempting to design the language to fit the data organization in the database, not the usage you are going to facilitate with that language. So have you been there? Have you had Absolutely. some experience with that? Absolutely. And I mean, trying to come up with, you know, uh, as I said, a part of our motivation for doing this uh, is to come up with the right abstraction or, or sort of take the abstractions that we've made that were too close to the data, the way it's implemented, the way it's stored, how it's, uh, how it's divided up, which cores are holding what, that sort of thing, too close to that. Um, the act of mentally getting out of that tangle is really tough and, and it goes through iterations. And sometimes you think, okay, yes, we are going to come up with a new better abstraction and then you spend a lot of time thinking about it and grappling and then a week later you realize, wait a minute, we just went around in a circle and came back to exactly where we started from. And so this is where, again, that, that sort of uh, being able to iterate on this, being, being able to, um, to, to keep things fluid initially is important. And that's also why the people implementing this language shouldn't necessarily be the only people involved in its design, right? You want that feedback from users because they are not, they're sort of unburdened by knowledge of the implementation. Um, sort of like when you, get, uh, when you get a newcomer to your team, they can also be like a really great resource of a fresh set of eyes. I, for example, uh, Uber Research has been dealing with this kind of data for uh, 15, 20 odd years. I am relatively new to the company and the fact that, that I am unburdened by that kind of uh, deep knowledge of how this has all been, uh, been implemented in the past has been something that, that's uh, been helpful to us as an organization. So definitely recommend trying to find uh, uh, users or uh, fresh eyes to help you come up with those abstractions so that you're not uh, accidentally falling back into the ruts that you're used to, because that's we all do it. There's no, there's no getting around it. But very good point. Anyone else want to make a question? We have time for a couple of 
course everybody's if you like want. let us get outside into the sunshine <laughs> so uh, you feel also feel free to grab me later or uh, or uh, yeah uh, contact me on uh, the various media and I guess uh, yeah. thanks very much thank you see y'all thank Come you on.